Good evening, everyone. My name is Whitney Keyes, and I'm the executive director of Seattle City Club. And I want to thank you for being part of our first virtual civic cocktail of the fall season. Before we get started, there are a few partners I want to thank. The first is our longtime media partner, the Seattle Channel, and another is Town Hall. They're our virtual program partner. Town Hall's inspiring programs create an engaged community, and they ensure that everyone has a voice. So when it comes to this program, Civic Cocktail wouldn't be possible without generous support from Comcast. They're our presenting partner. In fact, it's organizations like Comcast that help City Club move forward with our mission, informing, engaging, and connecting people in our community around civic issues to help strengthen our region. We've done this for decades, bringing different voices and different perspectives together in thoughtful, respectful ways. So you can be a part of the Civic Cocktail conversation by actually adding questions into the chat section. And while we may not answer all of your questions, every single voice is valued. So I wanna let you know that behind the scenes, there's a lot of work that goes into putting these types of programs together, especially when two nonprofits, Town Hall and Seattle City Club are involved. So I'd like to have you consider making a donation either during the program or after the program we will split those contributions 50% between Town Hall and Seattle City Club. So thanks in advance for considering supporting us. So for now, grab a drink of your choice, sit back and relax this important Civic Cocktail program with our host, Joni Balter. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the fall season of Civic Cocktail. My name is Joni Balter, and we have a great show for you tonight. Our guests this evening are Interim Seattle Police Chief Adrian Diaz, the night before he starts his new job. Thank you so much for joining us. And Reverend Harriet Walden, founders of Mothers for Police Accountability and a longtime human rights activist. Thank you so much for being here as well. You're Chief, welcome. tomorrow is the first day on the job. On day one, what are you going to do tomorrow? And what are you going to do differently from your predecessor? You know, I'm already going to have uh, so many challenges ahead. We're still dealing with the COVID pandemic. Uh, we have officers that have been impacted by the by COVID. Uh, we have officers that are in isolation and quarantine. So we always have to make sure that we're paying attention to that. We're dealing with nightly demonstrations. Uh, we've had an increase in shootings that have led to increase in homicides. We've actually uh, been focused on having community discussions on race and policing, talking about defunding, low morale. And then also what we also have to focus on is building relationships in the community. And these are all areas that, you know, th this is just from day one. And then this is what we build upon over the next several months about how we actually address these issues. Well, what in your view are like the top quick steps that you could take to um, to reimagine policing? Well, right now we have to make sure that we have enough staffing and patrol to handle our 911 calls. That, that is so crucial for public safety in this city. You and made so a change on that today already, right? Today I announced that I was moving 100 officers uh, from a variety of different units back into patrol. Uh, it is the core of what we do. It is the backbone of our department is being able to handle our 911 responses. And so that is one of the first steps that we're uh, starting off the day. So I want to come back to that in a little bit, but I want to bring in Reverend uh, Harriet Walden. Uh, as everyone knows, another black man has been shot by police this time in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, Reverend, you've been working on this issue for decades. Uh, what can we do to stop this awful pattern? Uh, one of the things we can do is actually look at history and tell the truth about it and, and just uh, examine why I, I number one, uh, it's the black people, uh, African Americans, what uh, I tell it, uh, you know, and once we've been Negroes, uh, we've been hunted uh, for a long, long time. And uh, even uh, Harriet Tubman, all the way back to Harriet Tubman, uh, uh, trying to free uh, 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 people that was in bondage. So there, there is something fundamentally uh, in the soil and in the hearts of the American people that has not been dealt with. And uh, until we really uh, tell the truth, and uh, and uh, this is the time to tell the truth. It really is. I mean, this is an auspicious time. We can tell the truth about race in America. Uh, and that uh, the, the 1916 dictionary says that 
he's afraid of a uh, uh, he was afraid of a Negro. It's called Negrophobia. It's in the dictionary, and uh, all the words in the dictionary in those dictionaries that allow people to be afraid of us uh, is probably part of uh, part of the problem that we have today. Reverend, but you you have the chiefs here right here. What give him some advice? What one or two changes must do changes? He has a he has a long list of things to do. But what one or two changes could he make right off the top that would make a well, difference to improve policing here? I think one of the, one of the things he can actually do is to actually try to engage with young people. I mean, because that really is what's going on right now is young people. I mean, we talk about what's happening on one side of the equation, but the but uh, uh, Chief Diaz uh, mentioned the other side of the equation, the uh, the escalated uh, escalation of violence in our community. Uh, these are both and situations in our community, and we need people who are willing to work in both and ways. Talk about how how the police has harmed us and continue to harm us, but also talk about how we are harming ourselves. And I, I think he's willing. I think he's willing to talk about that and maybe get out with uh, talk with the young people and actually show them another path the way there is a path uh, uh, to uh, to better your life and it doesn't have to be in crime and it doesn't have to be in any of those kind of things that young people get uh, trapped in and i think uh, i think Diaz has a great story uh he could tell his story uh, 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 and uh, he has a lot of experience might... in in youth violence prevention that's that's, that's right that's, that's right, right that's right that's right. That, that's right that's right and i think that he could re uh reimagine that piece and get our youth on a better footing uh, chief demonstrations continue, as you mentioned, in Seattle. Um, most are peaceful, but some have, you know, left behind the sh shattered windows and some fires. How are you going to manage that? How how is that going to roll in your administration? You know, we want to make sure that we're honoring, you know, uh, the people's right to peacefully protest. That hasn't changed. We have many protests every day that we do not actually have to respond to or be a part of. And so we want to make sure that and sometimes we are a part of just making sure that we're at honoring the free flow of traffic. But, you know, there are different, uh, I, I don't want to call them demonstrations because they're people that are looking out for violence. They're, they're actually missing the cause of what people are actually struggling and fighting for. And so those that are fighting for those violence, the acts of Molotov cocktails, lighting things on fire, creating property damage and destruction, assaulting people, those are the things that we're going to have to deal with. And it's a much smaller group and it's much more uh, you know, coordinated. And those are the efforts that we're going to be focused on. So, and this is for both of you. What about arresting protesters who, who do property damage? In other words, to draw that line uh, and protect property. I know there's another view on that, that property doesn't matter so much. But, you know, Joe Biden, for example, um, drew that line this week. Uh, and I guess he's got a big ad campaign coming out about that point. So I'd like to hear from uh, from you, Reverend, first about what about that <laughs> as an approach? Well, you know, I'm from the old school and, I, and I'm glad to be from the old school. I mean, I, you know, when people used to come and protest and come looking for us, they burned us out and uh, that kind of stuff. So I would never, ever uh, agree to the fact that it's OK to uh, earn uh, property now. I'm okay, I, I used to own a business, and as a business owner, a uh, small business owner, I think it's very uh, harmful for small business. And look at Seattle now. What is the way forward? How how will Seattle rebuild? What are the, what are the city uh, uh, elective people going to do to help rebuild Seattle? I think if a person is uh, caught setting a fire, I think the uh, I think the prosecutor need to prosecute that as a crime. I, I, I really and truly, and also one aside, if there were all those with African Americans out there, I, it would be a whole different story. I mean, really and truly. So, so a white privilege is part of this, and and it is a, it's been going on on some level ever since the May days in this, in Seattle. So you got to look at how long we've uh, the young people have been actually actually doing this, and then how you're going to corral it. And I, I just think that. Uh, uh, we have to say uh, it's okay to protest, but it's not okay to set other people's uh, businesses on fire. It, it's just not okay to do that. And Chief? Chief, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So what about drawing that line that, you know, property damage arrest? You know, those are the things that we are, are focused on right now is, is that as property damage occurs, we also have to make sure that we are safe in, in our response to, to being able to safely make those arrests and not spark a whole level of more violence. 
so we have to be mindful of that. But yes, we are you know, trying to address the crimes that are occurring. And like I said, it is a much smaller group of, of population. It is not a uh, large scale, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, it's not part of our large scale demonstrations that we're seeing this. Even when we had 60,000 or 80,000 people marching uh, uh, down 23rd, we didn't have any property damage. So right now we are just focused on, on those that are committed to, to you know, to that uh, type of destruction. Reverend, when we spoke last week, you said that the Black Lives Matter movement has been hijacked. How so? Well, it's hijacked because now uh, a lot of people just out there breaking stuff and saying Black Lives Matter. And, uh, you know, Black Lives has always mattered. I mean, let's be clear. That's what Harriet Tubman was talking about. That's what she was doing. Black Lives have always mattered. Uh, uh, and now, uh, you know, we're saying, I mean, the movement is about other people realizing that. And I, I just think that I, that they have hijacked it. I mean, really, I mean, I, it's not anything who's, who's to do they? about Mr. Floyd. Who's well, I mean, other people. Hijacked. I mean, the, they are a lot of people who show up that don't look like black people, number one. They've never spent a day in our shoes. Uh, and, uh, and it's okay for them to be our allies, but it's not okay for them to come actually and destroy, destroy property or either, I, I mean, and, and get uh, in other people's faces. I, that piece is just not okay. Uh, I'm from my perspective, and you know, I have 70 uh, decades on the planet, and so I have a right to speak for, well, from my perspective. And from my perspective, I think that I, I think that the movement has been hijacked uh, in a lot of different places, um, and uh, they're out there just uh, having themselves a good time. Remember, there's no jobs right now; <laughs> no schools to go to. <laughs> so hey, you know, if they had to go to work tomorrow, some of them probably would be home. <laughs> Chief, I'd like your response to that, and I'd like to understand how do police separate? They're in the heat of things, and there's, you know, different factions that are trying to uh, make statements and and conducting themselves in different ways. You have the example in Portland, where that was that was different people, different agendas. Yeah, you know, this is the difficulty right now of of being able to separate uh, when you do have people that infiltrate large scale crowds. Uh, that actually, you know, are there to cause damage. Um, those are the hard parts of, of our jobs of trying to, to separate that out. Uh, and I think right now, uh, for the rest that we have made over the last several weeks, it has been a much smaller group and it hasn't been part of the larger type of uh, uh, demonstration that we've seen. Uh, initially, when this started happening uh, in, in the initial phases of the George Floyd murder. And, uh, and I think Reverend Wall is right, right. We, you know, I think when we look at our past history of, you know, policing in, in, our, in America, um, we have to own our past. And we've looked at a lot of the different, de how we handled demonstrations in the, you know, 40s and 50s and 60s through the civil rights movement. We have to own that past, but we have to also learn uh, and grow for the future. And I, that's where I'm committed to making sure that our police department is learning from these uh, experiences and making it better and how we handle these type of demonstrations. Reverend, you know, one we, thing too, can oh, I actually ahead. want, I just want to put one thing, you know, when we were doing this, we had peacekeepers. I mean, the American Friends Service used to uh, actually train peacekeepers at every demonstration we ever had. We had peacekeepers there. I mean, because the peacekeepers- What does a peacekeeper do? Uh, well, do they, 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 they are trained to spot people who are coming to, uh, to, uh, to cause trouble. And uh, the peacekeepers guide those people out of the demonstration. And uh, actually make sure oh, that they're escort not... them out. Escort that's them out. Right. That's right. That's that's a peacekeeper. Peacekeepers are there for a reason. And uh, and uh, younger people. I mean, the way that they organize. I mean, I mean, we took full responsibility whenever we had a whenever we had a, a, a rally, or a demonstration, or whatever. We took full responsibility. Uh, and and uh, we everybody knew that we were uh, leading this. And so we wasn't leaderless. I mean, and so by taking responsibility. We also had peacekeepers to be able to keep people safe. If people are coming, if they're bringing their children or if somebody's pregnant, I mean, you know, it was our responsibility to make sure that those people were safe. And that's how, we, and that's what we did. We made sure we had peacekeepers. Reverend, do we need an East Precinct? You told oh, me uh, that you were <laughs> asked this very question by Seattle City Council Member Shama Savant. Well, she called and asked me if I would sign off on it being closed and turned into a uh, community center. And I told her no because it belongs to the African American community. I was there because of the late Sam Smith, the first African American that's ever elected to the Seattle uh, uh, City Council. 
And then how could you deprive 120,000 people in that sector without any police protection? I mean, it's 100,000, 120,000 people or more that lives in East Precinct, and that is south of I-5, I, I, you know, over by um, Mont Lake Cut, all the way down to I-90 from the International District, all the way down to Lake Washington. All of those people, and you were going to deprive them of, uh, of a precinct. I, and each precinct clearly belongs to us, and we want to see it open eventually, and Sam Smith named up there uh, as a history part of um, part of Seattle. And I don't think people want to go back to the days when the, when a car has become, a call has come from downtown Seattle or, uh, uh, or either out on the south end, because that's what was happening before East Precinct. And, uh, and shame on uh, uh, so on. Say that she, I mean, and the charter says it's supposed to be open. And she, just, she was an elected official wanting to deprive her district of, of police protection uh, uh, when somebody needs to call the police. And then somebody in that area needs to call the police and they need to get a response when they need to. Chief, you told me last week you already have been contacted by four of the nine city council members. The number may have gone up since we talked. Uh, I wonder, in your view, is this pro forma or is this a real change from maybe the way the relations were with your predecessor and your good friend, Chief Carmen Best? You know, I actually think uh, we all want, I believe we all want, you know, to reimagine community safety. We want, we all want public safety. So I believe that it is true for those that have reached out. Uh, I've actually had more reach out over the last, you know, several days. And so I'm actually looking forward. I've already been meeting with a couple of members uh, over the last couple of weeks. And uh, I believe these are honest, open discussions. I'm looking forward to, to working with them as we look through the 2020 budget and into the 2021 budget about what policing can and look, can look like in the city of Seattle. So I have an audience question from Rufus for Chief Diaz. Your predecessor was criticized for not doing enough to restrain officers who responded to peaceful protesters with violence. Will you take a different approach? You know, right now we, we learned a lot from the first couple of weeks of the George Floyd murders uh, demonstrations. And right now uh, we actually are seeing a different type of, of um, type of rioting situation over the last several weeks that are occurring at night. So it, we have learned from that past and we're lo looking at and having conversations with people all over the, this world from you know France and from uh, England and from Ireland that have handled demonstrations in different manners locally and, and nationally to, uh, to other police departments that can learn and handle uh, demonstrations better. So we are committed to doing things better but the demos, the, some of the things that are occurring at night, uh, we had last night, we had two Molotov cocktails that were thrown uh, at the East Precinct. Uh, we had a fire set a week before that. Was anybody injured by the, the no, the, no, no one was injured from, from last night. Uh, but the week before we had uh, the, the precinct set on fire as well. And so we have, we, you know, those are, are different responses. Those, because, we are because people are trying to light the east precinct on fire that isn't just about protecting the east precinct it's a protecting that whole block many of the that building is made up of 100 year old timbers and and so an impact of, of a firestorm there could impact the apartments that are right next uh, to the precinct so we have to make sure that we are providing overall protection for that whole city block Chief, I'd like to talk about you for a second, you specifically. All the reporting says, you know, you're very well liked. We already mentioned you have a pretty good background in youth violence prevention and community outreach, but you have little to no operational experience. How do you overcome that if you want uh, the permanent chief job? And while we're at it, do you want the permanent chief job? Yeah, you know, I actually, it, over the course of my career, I actually worked in an anti-crime team. Uh, so I actually gained a lot of operational experience. Uh, we served in an anti-crime team. You serve and handle operations in the street level, sometimes related to narcotics. Uh, you do serve warrants. Uh, and so those are areas where I've already had experience in. I was on a mountain bike for many years uh, in downtown Seattle handling demonstrations. So I had that operational experience. Uh, I have promoted up and I've handled a couple of the different large scale events in this city. So 
I, I do have some operational experience, but what you also have to realize when you're a leader that you don't always have to know everything uh, about each every each er and every component of the job. And it's making sure that you have the right command staff in place that ha that can fill those roles where you have weaknesses. And so, the, and that's what we have right now is we have a very competent command staff team that can fill those areas that I don't have as many strengths in. And you just have to know your team. And and do you want the permanent job? Have you, you know, decided that? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I've been asked that question a couple of times. I would say I didn't ask for this job when things were going well and quiet. I'm asking for this job and doing this job when things are the most difficult time. You know, I kind of gave you a list of all the different challenges that we're dealing with uh, that I'm faced with, and I'm willing to take those on uh, head on and willing to actually make adjustments. And it just shows you today, moving 100 officers, that has never been happened in the course of our history, of our department's history. And I'm willing to make those uh, leadership uh, changes uh, right away. And is that, move, is that moving of the officers there does that have something to do with overtime or is that just how you want to see things go as no, you're running this department? There's a lot of reasons for, for moving. Number one, our, we've uh, kind of reduced our patrol staffing levels to critically low levels. We were not even able to make you know minimum standards as far as having officers being able to handle just your normal 911 responses. Many times we were handling just priority calls for service. And so as we got to critically low levels, I wanted to make sure that we had enough officers to support patrol and making sure that it had adequate staffing. That's one. Number two, it actually reduces our overtime by not actually augmenting shifts. And so there are many reasons why we, we are having to do this, but it, right now, operationally, it is ensuring that we are, at, we are able to respond to people's calls for service. When people call 911, they don't care whether you have enough staffing or not, they're needing help. And so we may have to make sure that our staffing is, is appropriate to ensure that they get the help that they need. Reverend Walden, um, the city council, at least briefly here, bought into basically a protest slogan, defund 50%. How does that phrase help or hurt the goal of improved policing? Well, I, I don't, I think that it helps uh, a lot when you actually get down to the bottom of it and, and look at it. You said 50% uh, the Seattle police and any other police, uh, you're going to have to lay off uh, officers and you're not going to have adequate police protection. Uh, and the city of Seattle have almost 780,000 people in there. Uh, and I think that some of those people all, uh, in those areas need adequate police uh, uh, policing. I think there are some places that we could talk about, uh, you know, reimagining and also redistribution re, uh, of, uh, of resources. I mean, uh, and that's really, I think that's really what it's about, is how do you how do you look at shifting some of the resources and have some other uh, agencies or uh, other community groups uh, uh, up and running, but a lot of the groups is not, I mean, they're up and running, but they still have to get up to the, uh, up to the standard to be able to take on all the work that some of the SPD is doing uh, in, in a lot of areas. So I think it's a good, I think it's a, you know, it's a buzzword and, it, and there's, they, everybody's reading the, the book out there, The End of Policing, and, uh, and that's the new Bible now. And so that's, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, every now and then you get a new buzzword and this is really auspicious time for change in the world and, uh, and it will be changed. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, my goal is for, it, for all the voices to be heard uh, and for us to have a clear path of being able to work together and bring all the people to the table, the right and the left, and the people in the middle, I believe they need to stand up so they can help organize this path in the middle to go forward. So yeah, we're, we've invited our audience to participate and we have a question uh, from Maria for Chief Diaz. You mentioned the difference between <clears throat> protesters and demonstrators. What can you do to encourage the media to do the same? You know, I, I think that's really a discussion for the media. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that we just have to make sure that we're clearly outlining what is actually occurring in the streets. You know, I know many of media members have been harassed, have been, you know, uh, been pushed to the point where they, they're not supposed to film in these groups to avoid capturing, you know, some of the different destruction that has occurred. Um, and many of them have reported out on that. And I think that's what we we have to make sure that people are 
uh, reporting the facts and that they're, the information that they're getting out to the public is is the truth. And um, and so that's really some of the things that I think the media will end up having to look at themselves and say, are we reporting exactly what is occurring out there? And that's what we encourage. Reverend Walden, um, protesters crossed a line for some people when they went sort of many nights in a row to, to the homes of council members uh, this summer. What advice did you or would you give to protesters about that approach? Well, you know, I mean, I guess it's a different time, but like I said, when people, uh, well, I grew up in segregation, let me be clear, I grew up in Jim Crow. And when people were coming to your house, they were coming to burn you out. They were actually coming to kill you or to burn you out. So that's ingrained in me, that's part of my DNA. And so I'm absolutely would be opposed to that. I mean, I, I think that we should, uh, I think that people should protest and protest where they work at, uh, but going to people's homes, uh, to me, just brings back uh, memories of uh, people just being uh, burned out. And I think it's very disrespectful. I mean, I mean, because really, we have allowed the discourse to just to go down, 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 down. And at what point do we believe that we can actually come together and uh, and bring and bring people together, and to go out to uh, go out to uh, uh, Councilmember Juarez's house and spray paint and call and then call people bad all all these names bad words. like wow. Beg pardon. I said yeah, there yeah. were some bad words. I happened to see well, some and, pictures you know, of but, those, but that yes. doesn't that doesn't get you anywhere. And I'm glad I came through when people I, I actually wanted to organize a different way and to have a level of decorum about it. Uh, and I think I think you can still do that. I mean, we don't all have to be in the gutter uh, because leadership uh, around the country might be that way. I mean, I, I think our job is always to uh, is to find the middle road, to find that other path out there, and to be able to encourage people. To be able to bring them along, uh, so that uh, so that uh, and also register the vote. I mean, you know, if you're going to people's homes like that, I mean, I hope you're registered. I mean, I hope you can really make a big difference in November. If not, you just going to people's homes. Another audience question: This from Sarah for Chief Diaz. Who from the community are you consulting with over the budget and reform, and how did you select these representatives? Actually, we uh, as a city, uh, the mayor's office, the Department of Neighborhoods. Our police department have actually been help holding a variety of different um, uh, town hall types uh, of events. We've actually met with all of the different commissions uh, from Immigrant and Refugee Commission, uh, Women's Commission uh, that are a part of the city uh, that are made up of, of community members. So we've actually been listening to a variety of different people. When it comes to the, the budget, we're actually in conversation with uh, the uh, city council and the mayor's office about what reimagining and re-envisioning uh, um, the police department looks like. And those will be for broader discussions uh, more throughout the community uh, as we move forward. And I think we wanna make sure that all of us are at the table included in listening to all groups uh, that are out there. And I've actually uh, had um, meetings with some of the different demonstrations or some of the different groups that have been uh, protesting out there over the last several weeks and listening to their demands. And I've been willing to have those conversations with them. And on several occasions uh, of their demands, there are areas where I've actually worked uh, in, in, a, um, in the community working on many of those issues. Some of it is in relation to youth violence um, and decertification uh, of police officers that have been fired for, for wrongdoing. So there are areas that uh, we could actually see some level of common ground and some areas we might not see uh, that common ground. Reverend Walden, you told me when we spoke last week, um, everybody needs to chill out, uh, sort of as how to go forward. What, what, are you, what are you trying to say? Oh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, as fall comes uh, uh, and the summer of love is over and we're moving into fall, uh, how can we I, I actually imagine a place of Seattle being a child's place again? I mean, what can we bring to the table? What can we create uh, uh, going forward that Seattle will be a place for all people? Uh, and, uh, you know, and like I said, uh, you know, we're willing to work on that. I mean, because we know there's other voices out there. People are calling me all the time and I come all from Positive Seattle about how can they get involved? What can they do uh, uh, to be able to be part of that, uh, that uh, center path, uh, path of, uh, of walking, walking the middle road uh, uh, as, uh, P, uh, as uh, Rick Williams said on Sunday, being a peaceful warrior. I mean, uh, and then we can learn a lot from the Native community 
on, on how to walk that road and, and that kind of stuff. So that's what I'm about. I want to build bridges. That's what mothers have done. That's why we still around. We build bridges so other people could uh, walk across them. We're absolutely bridge builders. We stay at the table. We continue to work. I mean, through it all, we just never go home and we bring up some younger people who actually uh, like to, you know, like to stay at the table. As my granddaughter says, my grandma, grandma, we go into a meeting. And, you know, they grew up loving to go to <laughs> <laughs> So, they you know, like- we're raising up, raising up some more kids that love to go to meetings so we can be at these tables. And Chief, from you, I'd like to know, what, what do we do to begin healing? We, we really have been through a tough summer. We have been through a lot of stuff. You know, we have uh, Republicans using Seattle as like a, you know, a, ba- a caricature of, of a city, a city that, uh, you know, is filled with mobs. You get these calls from people saying, is Seattle okay? And so how do we begin the healing? I think, you know, we have to be willing to be uncomfortable. We have to be able to step out of our, our ability to just uh, stay with the norm and, and be able to uh, listen to others with differing opinions. And I think sometimes those are the challenges because we're so comfortable uh, listening to those that have the same viewpoints. But I think for even our police department, our officers, they have to understand the community. They have to understand the trauma that many of them have experienced. But also we want the community to understand that officers are also experiencing a a variety of levels of trauma. They're responding to shootings and homicides and, you know, having to take kids away from families that have neglected them. I mean, and and so that exposure over the course of their career can also create an impact for them. And so there's a lot of trauma that both parties are experiencing. We want to have those conversations to understand each other. It's always about listening and, and being able to have tough conversations. Well, I could talk to both of you for a very long time, but um, I am out of time here. Uh, We have been talking with Reverend Harriet Walden. She's the founder of Mothers for Police Accountability and Adrian Diaz, Seattle's interim police chief. Thank you both so much. We're coming back in a few minutes with Denise Juno, superintendent of Seattle Public Schools. Thank you. 
And we are back. Thanks for joining us. I am so happy to be sitting here with Seattle School Superintendent Denise Juno. Greetings. Thank you for being here. I'm so happy to be here. Superintendent, uh, school starts this week, but it won't be like regular school, right? Uh, it's going to look a little different. So could you tell us what it'll be like in the early days, the first part of the month, and then after? What, sure. what are we looking at? Yeah, so we are starting in a remote setting, so it's going to be unlike any year that we've ever kicked off school. Um, our teachers have been engaged in some professional development or training over the past few days. That will continue tomorrow. Um, and then school starts Friday, and we'll have all our students logging on for the first day of school. We are actually going to do what's called a strong start. And what we want our educators to do is to reach out to families and to students and make sure they're building really strong relationships. As you know, every year you get a new batch of students in front of you and you know in person allows you to really build relationships and so because we're in a different setting um, our educators will be reaching out and making those relationships making sure everybody's set up with the technology they need making sure that we're setting everybody up for success. But there's a difference between the early days of the month and the and the second half. Can you tell us so parents actually know what to, yeah, so they the probably first, know. But. The first week will be the strong start where we're just building relationships, making sure everybody's set up, making sure that they're, uh, the setup is for success. And then we'll be moving into our schedule of, there will be, um, you know, we heard loud and clear from families during the cl our closure in the spring that they needed more on live learning. And so our educators will be, you know, guests in everybody's home of sorts. They will be engaged in live learning, so providing mini lessons, providing some, um, you know, small group settings for students, maybe some one-on-one -on -one tutoring. So students won't be online all day long. It's That's not what we're set up to do. It is so to, they'll throw a lesson toward them and say, and then we'll get back and we'll check and see, right. it see will what be happened like, with you that. You know, all of our Zoom meetings, like we're, or our Teams meetings, we are in spaces where a teacher will provide a short lesson, have conversation with students. So be trying to recreate those types of classrooms, um, but in a virtual setting. Many parents, of course, are legitimately worried that their children are falling behind mm -hmm. during this time, aren't they? You yeah, know, honestly, I mean, it, it's falling behind. It's difficult. I mean, when we, you know, the entire country went, um, you know, had to close the doors to their school buildings and everybody had to engage in emergency crisis education when um, COVID-19 hit the country. And, uh, you know, I'm on calls with superintendents across the country, superintendents in the region, and everybody struggled. Everybody struggled to really try to make that pivot into providing remote learning. Um, and so, yeah, it was rocky and there were, you know, gaps. Um, there were kids who did not have technology, kids who did not have access to, to internet. And so there, were, there are certainly gaps that needed to be filled over, over this next fall. And what gives fall. you confidence that your school system, 53,000 mm -hmm. students, uh, is really ready for it to be any different or any better, that they will not be falling right. behind this fall? Well, we learned so many lessons and we actually had a really great summer school. So we had 400 educators who taught summer school. We learned a lot from them. Um, we, we surveyed families and what we heard loud and clear is live learning, set schedules, common platforms. And so we have built systems going into the fall. So I probably need a definition for live learning. Yeah. What, what is the definition? So live learning will be when a teacher actually and a classroom are online together. And so there's actual, that's when they'll provide the mini lesson, they'll have conversations in real time. And then there will be a section where it's sort of on-demand learning where students will be able to go in and maybe grab some other lessons to dive deeper into the content on their own time. But so does everybody stay in, in, that, in that virtual experience or some people get to go do their work separately? Uh, during the live lesson, yes, they will all be engaged. Just like if we were sitting in a classroom all together. And then these guys go over here and do yep, something. And they, so then there will be small groups and maybe there's some individual tutoring that goes on. And so we're trying to recreate create that type of setting, but in a virtual world. How does online learning, uh, you mentioned this the other day when we were talking, mm -hmm. how does that impact brand new students, kindergartners? I mean, they never get the moment to feel what a real classroom right. is. Well, this will be real for them, right? This yeah. will be their first step into a school system. It's going to be difficult. I mean, 
Uh, but our educators, you know, are, are like I said, they're engaged in some training this week. It is a different world for them as well. Um, but they know that there have to be some really engaging lessons that there has to be set up. I mean, they'll also be learning technology probably for the first time. And so there's all kinds of things that have to happen, all kinds of new learning. Um, but our educators are going to engage in that task and make sure that our students are engaged in learning. I'm sure that some of what is bothering parents, and this makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. if you think about it, is sort of the emotional day-to-day -day of this. They have students sitting in front of computers for a very long time. They're not with their friends. They may, they may actually have some emotional problems mm -hmm. that are going to come out because of this time. How much of this is on the district, you know, and what can be done about that? Yeah, I mean, part of our strong start this first week and throughout the year, we're trying to build in time where there are these check-ins, sort of. We know that there's going to have to be social emotional supports for students. You know, they haven't been together for a semester now. They haven't been together for the summer. They're going into a place where they're not going to be in person. And so much of human relationship depends on interpersonal uh, contact. And so we are going to spend a lot of time engaged in check-ins, how are students feeling, you know, how, how are... How Is that can, part of the school day? or it's Part just, of the school day. So the first week, the strong start, well, that will be built yeah. in. And then the schedules as they roll out will have um, check-ins and and sort of me mental health check-ins and social emotional learning sort of built into the school day. And then are counselors available if, if somebody picks up something that ne needs a little bit more attention? Yeah, I mean our special our special professionals like the counselors, the librarians, every art teachers, everybody will still be engaged in their respective role and so there will be all these touch points that uh, our scholars will be able to engage with. So I'm an adjunct professor at Seattle University, mm -hmm. and we've all spent part of the summer trying to learn how to get up to speed to flip our classroom mm -hmm. to virtual. Uh, I have to say, I still have a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. I don't know how um, effective it will be. But what kind of training were you able, what kind of time were you able, and what kind of training did you give to your teachers? Because this is definitely a different yeah, way I mean, of doing things. During, you know, during the spring when we had, we're doing emergency crisis education, I mean, our educators really rose to the challenge and learned technology really quickly of, of you know, being in rooms virtually. And so taking those, taking what our 400 educators provided, the learning that happened over the summer school. I mean, we had 15,000 students who engaged in summer school. Was so, that, do, is that a bigger number because huge. they felt like they fell behind? It was a huge number. And so that, I think that's really, as people were engaged in trying to catch up they were trying to get enrichment activities. And so we, that, we usually, this is th three, four, five times the number that we oh, usually have. So they and knew so, they were falling behind and they thought summer school would be a way to kind of right, either reaffirm the, lessons that had gone through March right, or getting, just getting, a, way. getting back up to speed and so being able to start strong in the fall again. Um, and now we are going, you know, we have common start times this school year. We have common uh, sort of chunks of time of how much time an educator needs to spend in live learning, what types of lessons. And so they're getting curricular issues, they're getting anti-racist education training, they are getting training on the platforms that we're using. And I think really what is going to be different and what's going to feel different as part of the experience um, in homes for remote learning is it's going to be more consistent and predictable than it was in the spring. That there will be the, all these common platforms and common times that, that our families and students can rely on. I see. Clearly the biggest worry about this is um, the technology. Mm -hmm. How do we get everybody up to speed mm -hmm. and computers and hotspots, you know, what can possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> right. So, so in fact, you are providing hotspots and computers for all of your students, is that correct? Well, for, You have an Alaska Airlines yeah, heroic yeah. thing today. Too. Yeah, we had great news <laughs> today. So uh, our district is moving to what we call a one-to-one -one device, which really means every student in our district will have a device, either a laptop or an iPad. Um, we were able to order enough laptops through the spring to now for our, three, our third grade through 12th grade. Those are being distributed at schools this week. Um, we had a supply chain issue with iPads. So we are providing iPads for our kindergarten through second grade. Oh. And so 
every district in the country right now really you know wants devices and so there was just a, a congestion in the supply chain it, our iPads landed in Boston and sort of got stuck uh -oh. and so yeah it was like yeah. what's going to happen we need to get these out to our kindergarten and second through second graders and so I called former governor Chris Gregoire who um, Heads up Challenge Seattle, yes. which is just the group of companies that come together and try to figure out the thorny issues that are she happening. She has them all on speed dial, I yes. Think. yes. And so I yeah. called her up and I was like, Governor, I need a plane. And so she called Alaska Air. Alaska Air flew out to Boston, loaded up those iPads, and got them here. And we had a great event today. Oh, okay. So we have 12,000 iPads now that are getting ready to be shipped out to school so that those can be distributed to our kindergarten through second grade. I see. So um, will some schools do some of the hybrid, meaning there would be some in class? Uh, do you have any schools doing that this year? Not to start this, out. This, not this. to start out. We do have, uh, if special education, if there are students with the individual education plan or IEP um, with special needs that in their IEP it is written that they need in-person instruction, oh. there will be some in-person instruction started then. The interesting thing is that um, our board recently passed a resolution that uh, you know is going to open the doors a bit for us to be a little more innovative moving forward and so looking at outdoor education or looking at community schools let's you know let they, they want us to think big about how are we um, going to make sure that students particularly students of color for this from educational justice are staying engaged and if that requires some meeting in outdoor spaces then how are we going to make that happen so i love the idea of outdoor learning mm -hmm. uh but i'm wondering how long into the calendar year this is seattle right how long into the calendar year and where Right. would be the venue for that. Well, and that's why, you know, it's part of a resolution for us to work with the city, work with other community-based organizations. We have, you know, playgrounds and we have fields that um, can be accessed. And so those are all the moving pieces that need to be uh, determined. And, you know, there's still protocols and processes that have to be put in place for health and safety. And so we'll be looking at all those. We're not quite there yet because we really want to make sure that we're starting school remotely in a really strong way. Um, and then there will be a task force that helps us come together. And if there are schools that want to do pilot programs, um, you little, know, that we can- A freedom then, to innovate. Yeah, there. some yeah. innovation that can happen, you know, of let, let's figure out how to support those efforts. What can we learn from them that can then be spread across the district? I see, so uh, audience question uh, from Rufus. How will you balance the need for safety with the requirements of individualized education programs. Yeah, so I think that is, you know, we always follow the advice of public health. I mean, that is what sort of closed our building doors. Um, it, it kept us closed this fall that, you know, when there was the, at the time that we made the decision to go to remote, the uh, public health was saying, you know, the yeah. spike in transmission rates was really skyrocketing. And so we had to make You're a decision. You're talking about last, in, back yeah, in March. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so, you know, we always balance that. They give us guidelines about when we are signing into buildings, these are the types of protocols that need to be in place. This is the type of PPE that's necessary. We're following all those rules, all those guidelines. And so when people have to access our buildings, all of those are in place. So back to the outdoor education mm -hmm. for one second. I had a crazy idea for outdoor learning. Mm -hmm. What about T-Mobile Park? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking taxpayers paid a lot of money for that roof. <laughs> um, and the place sits there, you know, many days. And I'm just wondering if, um, you know, be cold in there, but but you could pre prevent the downpour yeah. on the books. Anybody yeah. call? Anybody have any ideas Nobody's on that? Nobody's called yet, but we're open to all those calls. I think that there are a lot of places around the city that we can start looking at, um, you know, following the board's resolution about let's be innovative. Let's think about how we can get... Uh, students in person for those that really need access to humans right and to make sure that you know every now and then you need to set your eyes on somebody in, in real life and so how can we make those kinds of things happen well with that in mind what do you think of learning pods you know um there some families and mm -hmm. neighborhoods are forming these first are they safe mm -hmm. that's one question and then second are they equitable well those are both questions that uh you know, safe, I think, has to be determined by those parents who are forming those pods. I mean, that is, I mean, the reason we're not coming back to in-person is because, 
you know, there are some health concerns um, of having adults and students all in the same place. If they're all learning together, I mean, that's, that's one thing. And I'm not sure about the answer about safety. Equitable, you know, I think the answer is definitely no. Uh, that, you know, by forming pods and having the privilege to be able to do that um, leaves a lot of people out. And it allows those who don't have the privilege to come together, um, you know, still in a remote setting, not being able to get, engage in that. So the idea is, is that, you know, outdoor, if we can find outdoor places, if we can find community-based organizations, if we can pull in some other resources, the city has been a great partner and they are starting, they're going to open up these teen hubs oh. so that there can be gathering spaces. Um, so, you know, we have to figure out the equity issues as that moves along. Well, if they're not equitable, you wouldn't move to stop them. I mean, no, I mean, those are parent choices. Yeah. And I mean, frankly, right now, a you know, families can't make a wrong choice for themselves and for their students and their children. So it has to be very flexible like yeah, that, right? I think that is going to be the name of the game going forward. We have to be so flexible and we have to provide each other grace. I mean, things are going to be glitchy and things are going, you know, things are going to, it's, things will go wrong. And, um, you know, I think it's just a reminder of that we're all in this together. We are willing to adjust. We're willing to change course. We can do all these things. Um, it takes a little bit of time, but flexibility is going to be the name of the game. President Trump wants students back in school, mm -hmm. but schools are the ultimate local government. Of. And um, do you think Governor Jay Inslee was right to recommend online learning for most counties uh, in our state, including King County? Yeah, I think the governor's done a great job as far as mitigating and monitoring um, COVID-19, you know, making sure that people are wearing masks, putting rules and regulations in for restaurants. And so I think his guidance to keep school buildings closed right now is a good one, um, that he is listening to the science and the data and the public health, and that's what we should all be doing. So audience question now from Cam. Since this is the first time we've ever started the school year online, is there a plan for evaluating and adjusting the strategy? Do you have, you know, moments and time to yes. figure out if it's working? Yeah, and actually part of um, the board resolution that passed when we were uh, approving the remote learning plan is to put a task force in place. And so we'll be pulling on our community members um, to really, uh, let's create uh, you know, a system and then let's check in on the system and let's work with public health and let's determine how and what are, where are those areas that we're going to need to adjust and be flexible moving forward. And so we'll be putting together a task force that will help us monitor our structures, our system, and then of course looking forward about where does the public health advice need to be so that we can start thinking about coming back either in what we had planned for a hybrid approach, coming back fully in person, looking at other spaces. Um, and so we'll be relying on our community task force to help guide that conversation. When coronavirus first hit back in March mm -hmm. um, and even into April, schools were reluctant to continue to be open um, because, and, and even to do some of the virtual things mm -hmm. that were available uh, for equity issues. A lot of parents were upset that mm -hmm. you know days and weeks went by, students weren't really learning much. Do you have any regrets about that? You know, I think that we just learned a lot from, we had, we had a lot of lessons that we learned over, over that time. Um, and, and it's hard to look back and think of a different uh, decision that could have been made at that point. I mean, we are just now getting to one-to-one -one devices, right? We still have an issue with internet and we are talking at the very basic level, access to public education. Right now means that every student has a device that works that they have internet so that they can access education and that they have a set up. I mean, there's just so many issues that we need to look at. And so I think still it was the right call. I think that we learned a lot of lessons. I think we are stronger now because of the lessons we learned now going forward. So how much are you working with local tech companies mm -hmm. uh, to pro provide the computers? You said you're paying for them mm -hmm. aren't, and Wi-Fi access. Mm -hmm. Are they helping? Oh, are sure. they involved? I mean, Amazon in the spring stepped up and provided 8,200 Chromebooks for our elementary students who did not have a device. Um, and they did that go pretty quickly? Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, yeah, they were gone in a couple days. And uh, we are working with Comcast, you know, to provide 
uh, reduced or free internet for some families. Uh, there were companies, C City, which is sort of a group of tech yeah, companies. Yeah, I read your op-ed about yeah. that. They're gonna, is it actual uh, tech support? So if you've, your, your student's hooked up and uh, doing a lesson and then something goes wrong, you can actually call this, yeah, this so nonprofit we, we C had, City? Um, we, we as a district can provide support for our staff. We can provide tech support for our students. We don't have the capacity to really fill in the gaps for family tech support. So, I mean, so these folks would show up at your house no, and start no, playing around so with the City, wires or like, what? They have a call. So like if there's assistance oh, see, that needed, center. they call. But the great thing is, is that they also provided um, you know, language, other language speakers who could, they could connect with families who oh, spoke wow. languages other than English. Um, and so they were phenomenal at helping families uh, engage with the technology, making sure that they knew how to connect, making sure that they had the right software on, um, and, and they'll continue that effort going forward. So it's just super, so yes, a lot of companies that Microsoft stepped up and provided some things. And so, there, it was a, one interesting um, component that happened is, I believe it was Amazon stepped up and we really you know, tried to focus in on really our vulnerable students and so students experiencing homelessness, getting them a device and making sure they had a hotspot and access to the internet during this closure. So they stepped up and provided these wireless uh, extenders in some of the shelters around town so oh, that students okay. didn't have to sit in a crowded, noisy common area, that they could actually go do their schoolwork elsewhere. And so just being really thoughtful about how um, everybody can pull together and support students. And I think that's really been a really great uh, lesson and a really good outcome for our city is everybody's pulling together and making sure that we're filling gaps as much as we can um, to provide our scholars a really great education. Question from the audience from Sarah. Uh, most IEPs were not written with the idea that specificity was needed for in-person learning. That was assumed. Mm -hmm. How will IEPs be updated urgently to make sure all children who need in-person learning have their IEPs yeah, updated? Yeah, so our special education department is really engaged in that, and they know that they have to look at every single IEP in our district, so that will take a while, um, but they are engaged in that work right now, and so they will be looking at that following the process of IEPs and determining, you know, because we're in a new setting, what does, what, what, what needs are necessary moving forward. The city announced this week that it is investing nearly $95 million from the city levy uh, to improve programs that address race-based disparities in education and also to boost mm -hmm. college and career readiness. How can that help us really quickly since? Yeah, I mean, that's the, their levy dollars, right? Those are the dollars that, uh, Thank you, taxpayers, uh, that they continue to provide. Um, and those are have been uh, the work with schools that the city has been doing. And so it really is sort of an ongoing program of sorts the, of their direct assistance to um, some schools in our system. And so just expanding on the opportunities that that funding has provided will continue. Um, we are really engaged with the city around making sure that we are uh, working really closely with the, particularly the schools that they provide money to and also, you know, like these teen hub centers, child care providers. There's just a lot of nexus between the city and our school district that we continue to build upon. When you and I spoke the other day, um, mm -hmm. you highlighted the fact that Seattle Public Schools, the strategic plan emphasizes African-American teens and boys. Mm -hmm. So how does that focus translate and figure into virtual? learning. Yeah, and so there are things, I mean, our strategic plan, we call it Seattle Excellence, is steeped in racial equity um, and really uh, asks us to look at and dismantle the racist uh, structures within our organization. And so Seattle Public Schools has actually been engaged in deep racial equity work for years. And again, you know, even the training with teachers over this week is, has some anti-racist education training built in, culturally responsive education. When we started delivering devices out in the spring, our strategic plan calls on us to focus on students of color first from educational justice with an intentional focus on African-American teens and boys. And so when we deliver um, computers to the community or to our students, 
we make sure that our African-American boys and teens are taken care of first. And so that really is the priority in all of our thinking, centering those voices, um, and making sure that we're engaging uh, black and African-American families and communities. And how does that focus sort of impact, you know, other parts of academics like mm -hmm. grading? Yeah, and so, I mean, our top priority in our strategic plan is third grade reading. And so we have Seattle Super Readers. We have identified 13 schools in our district that have 50% uh, of our African-American male kindergarten through third grade, and so they get extra supports. We are trying to make sure that we're working really closely with those 13 schools to provide the supports that are necessary so they build a strong literacy program, that we are you know, providing books that are culturally relevant, that are written with black characters, with by black authors, and really trying to make sure that we are focused in on engaging reading, on teaching literacy skills, um, and then providing any extra supports those schools need to get the job done. Uh, what is your position on school uh, resource officers mm -hmm. in schools? That came up to be just a big issue as, as the protests were, right. were getting rolling through the summer. It's a complicated issue for Seattle Public Schools. We had four. We had four what were called emphasis officers. We had one school resource officers in Seattle Public Schools, and so they weren't widespread. and. Uh, Acting Chief Diaz actually, or Interim Chief Diaz was one of the beginning people who helped start that program. And it started um, emphasis officers as a result of let's get in and provide mentoring to students. Um, and so, you know, it was a mixed bag. It was really hard because that is really a huge issue, I think, across the country. Um, but speaking with the principals in those buildings who had emphasis officers, they were also doing good. Um, Right now, the board passed a resolution, let's take a pause, so that, right? Yeah. Let's take a pause, let's work with the police department, let's make sure our values align, um, and let's make sure that if we're going to do this work together, how can we actually get it done so that our students continue to feel like their schools are safe places um, and that everybody's working together on And I have issue. to take a pause because we are out of time. <laughs> uh, we have been catching up with Seattle School Superintendent Denise Juno. So much more to discuss, but we are out of time. Civic Cocktail returns in October, heat of the election season. Thank you so much for joining us and good night.